this seminar workshop is about marketing. And I have a couple of just rules in general. Um, one is that I ask everybody to keep an open mind. Um, number two is, is I ask you, what, I call it the twibs, which is this won't work because it's the same thing as we've tried this before and it didn't work. Usually all of those type of programs have reasons for not working. So I, I, I caution you not to throw out an idea or turn your mind off to something just because we, we might have tried that before. And this seminar is, is general in nature. I'm going to talk specifically about marketing Hot Springs Village, but it's really applicable to anyone. So if there's any business people in the room here that have businesses, anything we talk about today is really relevant across a spectrum of different possibilities. The other thing is this is a, a, a seminar workshop that is actually two days long. It's, it's 16 hours in length. I've, I've conducted this many, many times. What I'm doing today, don't worry, you're not all going to be here for two days. <laughs> I'm trying to consolidate it down into r roughly an hour, hour and 15 minutes, so we've got plenty of times to ask questions. So we're going to hit on a lot of the topics, a lot of the highlights. Please feel free to ask your questions when we're done, and I'll try to give you more detail that we might not have covered. Um, the other thing I want to point out about this seminar workshop is that these are not my ideas, okay? This is not the Phil Lemler marketing plan for Hot Springs Village. This is simply how Fortune 500 companies, large organizations that are marketing driven and marketing oriented go about deciding what kind of a marketing plan they're going to implement. So, so these are not my ideas. You can find these in any textbook in marketing school at Harvard or University of Illinois or, or any other college curriculum, it's pure marketing 101. The last thing I want to caution you about is the biggest mistake made in marketing is marketing to ourselves. And it's, it's something you really have to wrestle with as you go through developing marketing plans, even thinking about advertising strategies, is we have a real tendency to market to ourselves. Well, I moved here because, you know, I like the lakes. And so therefore everybody should be moving here because they like the lakes. Or I moved here because of this reason. Or my neighbor moved here because of another reason. Or I like the color blue, so everybody should like the color blue. Those are all elements of marketing to yourselves or marketing to ourselves. I've been doing this for 45 years. I still have to consciously prevent myself from marketing to myself. So this is not something that that happens overnight. It's not there's no pill you can take to keep yourself from doing it, but you just need to be conscious of it as we go through the process. Um, the first thing about marketing is most people misunderstand marketing. Most people refer when they refer, refer to marketing they're thinking of advertising and promotion. How we advertise the village, how we promote the village, how we advertise our product or service. The reality marketing is actually much, much more than that. Marketing is about understanding your customer extremely well and then managing everything in that process from making the customer aware of what you have all the way through till the product is delivered into his hands. That's all part of the marketing process. So it's not just advertising and promotion. Um, it's really knowing your customer, knowing your target market, knowing who you want to communicate with on an advertising and promotional basis. An example I use is assume we were going to have a Thanksgiving dinner and we decided that, um, well, let's invite the governor of Arkansas to our Thanksgiving dinner. He's over there in Little Rock and so we all sit around as a group and let's talk about what kind of a meal we're going to serve and you know Tormy says well we gotta have we gotta have Uncle Joe's turkey and he bases it out on the grill and it just tastes so good and he uses the drippings again and man people just love his turkey 
And Diana says, well, yeah, if we do that, we've got to have Aunt Louise's sweet yams. She just loves, she makes the best sweet yams in the world. And Dennis Helmer says, if we do that, we've got to have my pumpkin pie. I make the best pumpkin pie from scratch, and it just takes, tastes great. So we all agree to that. We start writing letters to the governor of Arkansas, and we tell him about this great dinner we've got planned. We've got turkey and the sweet yams and, and the pumpkin pie, and we get no response back. So we send another letter to the governor, and still no response. Well, we're a little bit disappointed by this, so we start running ads in the newspapers in Little Rock, figuring, well, we must read these newspapers, and we run thousands of dollars worth of ads Radio silence. We still have not heard a single word from him. We start calling his aides and the people that surround him and see if they can get us in the door. Maybe if we made a direct sales call on the governor, he would see that we've got a great dinner plan for him. And each time we describe the dinner and we tell exactly how we're going to cook it and we go through Uncle Joe's special recipe for the turkey, still nothing. Long story short, the governor never comes to our Thanksgiving dinner because we find out later that he actually hates turkey. He got sick on turkey when he was a little kid's never been able to be in the same room with it again. Doesn't like sweet yams. He's a mashed potatoes guy and would much rather have pecan pie versus pumpkin pie. The last thing we find out is he doesn't schedule any of his own stuff anyway. His wife does. <laughs> so that's marketing. That's the difference between advertising and promotion, which we did, but we totally missed the marketplace. We didn't understand the customer. That's what marketing is all about. When you create a business plan for any organization, the first thing you create is the marketing plan. Everything then else is, is layered on top of the marketing. Now, I apologize to the people in the back, but Here's what I'm going to do. This is the marketing plan. I'm just building a pyramid of blocks here. And what I've written in right there is marketing. On top of this, we have things like, um, let's call it our development plan. Operations. other POA kind of functions. The marketing plan is first, and the marketing plan is a part of that foundation because everything we do is affected by the marketing plan. Perfect example, if in our development plan we decide to build an apartment building, what's the first question we want to know when the, bar the apartments are built? Who's, who's going to live in them? Where are they going to come from? How are we going to advertise to find those? We find that into the marketing plan. What, what are we going to do with people when they come into the village? How, how are we going to deal with them? How are we going to process them as it leads? All of that is a part of the marketing plan. So your marketing plan becomes the foundation of your business. It tells you all the things you're going to need to know to base everything else. It tells us how we're going to communicate, who we're going to communicate with, and ultimately, the marketing plan creates the revenue that drives the business. Now, what is marketing actually? I try and write and talk at the same time. Marketing actually has four P's. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. There's numerous variations. There's now seven layers of different stuff and some of them bring in psychology and behavioral science and other things, but basically in marketing there's four P's. And what those are is product, price, place, excuse my ugly writing, Cheryl I told you it would get ugly, and promotion. The product, in essence, is kind of who we are and who we target.
price in our case, as far as Hot Springs Village goes, since we really don't control pricing, and pricing really goes across a spectrum of things, it could be the price of houses, it could be the price of POA fees, it could be the value of living in Arkansas, cost of living basis, those things. So it's actually a lot of different things, but within our, and this is by the way called the marketing mix for you that, that want to take notes and keep track, the price is really not under our control. The place is everything to do with getting that product to the customer. For example, uh, the distribution. As if you're selling widgets, how are those widgets getting sold and how are they getting delivered to the customer? It also includes, and this is the biggest part of place, is sales or prospect management in our case. And we'll talk more about that later, but I'm a big believer when you invest marketing dollars, specifically in advertising and promotion, those leads become gold. Whoever calls on the phone, whoever sends in, I'm interested in Hot Springs Village, that is a golden opportunity. If we don't treat them in a very determined, specific, and defined way, we're wasting those advertising dollars. And then, of course, over here is all of your advertising. This is your ads, this is you know direct mail, it's your website, you know, brochures, social media, all the different methods of promoting Hot Springs Village. So when we look at what is marketing, most people, like I said, think it's promotion. In actuality, these are the things that must come first. Who are we and who do we target? Customers buy on emotion. Okay, for when someone buys a product, there's really a psychological connection to that product. And there's a mental buying process that people go through. And typically, especially in larger products, people will rank products what we call the top, the number one product in a category, and then they have a second product in a category, and a third, and they'll usually select one of the top two or three to go through their decision-making process on. And an example is, is if you, if I asked you what's the best selling tractor in America, what would you say? Caterpillar. John Deere. John, John Deere. Deere. Caterpillar, that's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's John Deere. Why? Because John Deere has done a wonderful job of marketing their company over the years, and they've created a top of mind position in a category. So if, if I'm a farmer, and, and I'm going out to buy a new tractor, unless my brother works at a Kubota dealership, I'm going to at least consider John Deere as one of the options that I'm going to look at. Well, the guy was a genius that came up with the slogan, nothing runs like a deer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that thing, that was a genius thing. It was. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about John Deere and, and Caterpillar as well and, as we go along here. Um, my cousin was the CEO of Caterpillar for nine years. Donald Fights. I played golf with him. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so if I say fried chicken, most people will say Kentucky Sanders. Um, you know, if I say coffee shops, most people will say Starbucks. Those people through marketing have all created top of mind positions. And in the marketing plan, this product of who we are and who we target is really the first building block. So what we are, or who are we, which is the first of these, is not what we think we are, it's what the market perceives we are. Have you all heard the phrase, perception is the product, not the product itself? Well, that's true. And if you look at Hot Springs Village, Hot Springs Village in the marketplace is perceived as a retirement village, okay? We can't change that market perception without millions and millions of dollars worth of advertising and, and promotion. And it's very difficult for us to change. So the, 
the first premise in building our marketing program for Hot Springs Village has to be that we are a retirement village. Um, trying to change that, and, and we've been that for roughly 50 years, and probably in 1970 when Mr. Cooper started this, he didn't think of this as a retirement village, and it probably wasn't. But markets create those brands over time based upon who you are in the marketplace and how you advertise, and more importantly, why people come here. So we're, we've ended up to be a retirement village. If we try to communicate to the marketplace that we're something different, we begin to erode that brand, okay? If we say, Take IBM. IBM, most people recognize, is in the computer business in some form or another. If they next week decide to get into shoes, I don't care how much money they spend in advertising and promotion and marketing, 10 years from now, people are still going to perceive they're a computer company. So the market, the perception of the product determines who we are as a village. And it's counterproductive to spend money to try to defeat what the marketplace already has in its mind. It wastes money, number one. It takes money away from using that perception to our advantage in a marketing standpoint. And ultimately it erodes our brand. So the more money we spend on trying to be something that's not a retirement village, the more money we're going to waste and the more we're going to road that brand. So, who is our target market, which is the second part of the product? Who should we be targeting? First of all, what is a target market? You know, everybody uses target market all the time. Is a target market mean the only people we want to come and live in Hot Springs Village? No does not mean that at all. Does it mean only the people that would buy here is, is who we're going to, to market and advertise toward? No, absolutely not. It's about finding a group of people, target marketing is about finding a group of people that number one <coughs> is large. In other words, it has to be large enough to create a viable market that we can advertise and, pr and promote within that will create the kind of revenues that we need a, as a village. It needs us to be able to large enough and substantial enough that we can focus our advertising dollars. For example, and again, it, this is not about who wants to live here, who we think is going to live here. This is simply about focusing advertising dollars. If you look at Burger King, for example, Burger King's target market, they spend all of their advertising dollars targeting males 18 to 35 years old. But if an old dude like me walks in there and asks for a cheeseburger, are they going to turn me away? Absolutely not. In fact, most people don't even, they are so widely recognized as a brand, most people don't realize it, but that's how they focus their money. You won't see a Burger King ad on a show for, that caters to, to elderly folks or to females. It's all the 18 to 35, the sports networks and, and, and the race cars and NASCAR and those kind of things. That's Burger King's marketplace. Another example is Starbucks. Starbucks targets actually working people, okay? People that are employed and, and, and are in the workforce and they are busy and most people buy this coffee on their way to work. Does that, again, does that mean that we can't go in there and buy coffee or if we're retired we're not gonna sell, sell us coffee? No, it just happens to be the way they focus their money. They both, multi-billion dollar corporations, both recognize that they can't advertise to everybody. They can't just mass advertise in every media, in every newspaper, on every channel, and radio, and television, etc. It's just too inefficient. So they have to focus on a target market, and that's what they do. Secondly, thirdly, a target market needs to have what I call splashover. 
just a clarification, this you will not find in Harvard Business School. <laughs> this is my own philosophy. Splash over, what this means basically is all of the other people that are affected by that marketing. So I might target guys that own Corvettes, but he gets my brochure and Tormy takes it over to the neighbor next door, okay, because he finds something in my brochure particularly interesting. That's splash over, okay? There's probably an actual name for it somewhere, but I've been out of marketing school for 45 years, so I probably forgot it. Um, third, fourth, fifth, man, my writing's terrible. Fourth, we need a pipeline. When, when, when we choose a target market, we don't want to choose something that's so specific that it doesn't have more value to people coming down the line. So I might not be in the market for a Corvette today, but living next door to Tormy and watching him drive his, after four or five years, Uncle Joe dies, I get some cash, I'm heading to the Corvette store. Because I've a part of the pipeline that's coming along as a part of that. Our marketing and our advertising or promotion needs to be concentrated into the pipeline as well. Because what that does is that builds a future. We can, we can create a marketing campaign and an advertising campaign that sells two or three hundred houses a year, but we want people coming next year and the year after and the year after. If we build, do the right marketing, build the right pipeline, those people will continue to come. And then it's a matter of managing that market rather than recreating an image in that marketplace. We want to, I hate this microphone. Can everybody read that scratch? We want a pipeline, excuse me, we want a target market that where we offer substantial advantages to the target market. Okay? In other words, things that we have to offer is our products and services, whether we're Hot Springs Village or Joe's Shoe Store, we want to be able to say we do something better than anybody else because that puts us higher up in the decision-making process. We, we have a perceived advantage in the marketplace. Do you view that like having a strategic defendability? That's, that's, that's very, very much a part of it, and we're going to talk about that here in a couple seconds, but great question. Ask me that later. Um, most, most important about What we want to do is we want what's called product differentiation. Differentiation. That's probably spelled wrong. I'm going to get an F on spelling. I know that. In other words, we want to offer advantages over what the competition offers. In order to do that, we need to look and see what makes our product different. How can we differentiate ourselves within this target market that makes us come to top of mind? So when someone says tractor, they say John Deere. When someone says active lifestyle retirement community, they say Hot Springs Village. That's where we want to be. So we are, when someone thinks about retiring, we come top of mind. We're the first thing they think about because we've done an effective job in marketing. Product differentiation is, is a major problem for companies. Not only our size and the shoe store size, but Fortune 500 companies. They've all run into the same thing. Caterpillar has been differentiating. John Deere, we talked before, Back in the 1800s, John Deere actually started the company. He invented a plow that was made out of a plow blade, 
because all of the competitive plows, all the heavy dirt and mud and stuff stuck to that plow blade. So he figured out a way to create a plow blade out of some kind of saw, I believe, that ejected that and, and didn't allow the mud to stick to it. So it made the farmers much more efficient. Then they went into the process of, of building farm equipment, you know, combines and plows and all of the other things that farmers use. But International Harvester came along in 19 whatever it was and introduced competitive products. And so that's when John Deere moved out into the tractor world and began, they actually bought a tractor company, but they started diversifying into tractors. Every company faces these. If you look at, there, there is something that explains what we've gone through. And I apologize for a second for getting into the weeds on this, but there is something called the diffusion of innovation theory. And what the diffusion of innovation theory is, it, it's really applicable to new products, new companies, new ideas. There's, it's used in psychological uh, arenas for a variety of things. But basically what it is, and I'm sure you've seen it before, is there's a bell curve, which is basically time and the number of consumers. And it goes something like this. And in general marketing terms, there's people out here, they're called the innovators, and then the early adopters, and then the, the majority, and then the, the late majority, and then the, the stragglers at the end of it. And this basically shows, over time, the number of consumers that accept a product for a period of time, over the life of that product. If you look at Hot Springs Village, back in 1970, when we started, as, and, and, and I don't know, I, if I could get into the files that, uh, in our organization, I could probably give you some specific dates. But there is some point out here where, although the market and people retiring were increasing, our leads started going like this, down. Okay? What year was I'm saying, I'm guessing between 2006 and 2008. Okay. Well, oh, oh. We actually have, we actually have two different, we have a, ours is a double hump. We've got a double hump camel. We have a time period, and I can't remember the exact dates, and the biggest thing was going on in the, um, we had a, we had a period in the early 90s that we had the most houses built ever, and I can't remember the exact year, 450 that year. And then we came and we had a little dolder and we started going down again, and then we went back up again. And then we had the financial crisis of 2008. And then we, and, and I don't mean to be political here, but we suffered through the Obama years. And, and so, and now we're, we're down in here. Right. Well, the, yes, so I, I don't we know. Have a, we have a double hump. Diana, I don't know what happened back then, so I, I'm not going to yeah. speak about anything. I, I'm talking about just general world theory. This is how things go. What happened right here, this is the same point where John Deere diversified into tractors. Okay, It's the same point where Apple and their iPhone had to diversify into services and other things and coming up with new technologies because Samsung, but the difference is, the difference is, is that what we did, and, and, and you can't fault anybody, this is no one's fault, this is typical management stuff. Now actually what I'm talking about is what happens in here Let's say you opened a shoe store, back to my shoe store, here in the village. And you're selling shoes and, and you're just making all sorts of money and there's lines waiting for people to get in and out of the shoe store. Some other entrepreneur drives along and goes, wow, look at that. And he decides to open up a shoe store as well. What happens to your business? Okay, it's most likely going to get cut in half because you've got new competition. That's what happens here, is what happens is people see 
more and more people buying here, that brings more competition in the marketplace. So what it did to answer your question specific, there's more retirement communities that start rising up. There's more developing, the Dell Webs, the Villages, all of those folks over time, and, and again, I don't know the specific dates, but I do know that the pressure of competition drives leads down if you don't do anything about it. So if, if we're one of 20 places someone can retire, and all of a sudden people have 300 choices of where to retire, that gives people a lot more options to go to. And what we've seen is our leads and sales have dropped off because we didn't make the right product differentiation changes in the village. Our marketing plan needed to be revisited at that point and redeveloped so that we could move forward. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, the, the, the recession of 2007, 2008, 2009 did have an impact on us, but the real problem was this, was, the, was the, the, the lack of product differentiation. We didn't handle the competition right. We didn't really know about it until then. It's like Warren Buffett has a great saying. He says, you won't know who's at the beach swimming naked until the tide goes out. Okay, well, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what happened here is the tide went out with the recession. It st started exposing our, our our marketing vulnerabilities and the what we decided to do from a marketing standpoint is is to implement the CMP the, the comprehensive master plan and this is not faulting anyone who was there doing that if, if you don't understand this stuff in depth it's it's a logical solution because you sit back and you go wow look at this we've got you know, thousands of lots we can develop. We can grow this village. We can do like Mr. Cooper originally planned. If we get more people in here and build it out, we'll get more revenues, we'll get more leads, and things will, things will improve. The problem is, is that my personal opinion is that wasn't the right, the right solution. So, how do you choose a target market? Well, we look for these things. But what you do is you've got to take your top competition and figure out who they are and what they have to offer. And then look at Hot Springs Village and figure out how can we be better than each of those competitors in a specific area. What do we do? Not that we're choosing any particular people to come here, we're just figuring out who can we target and how can we set ourselves apart in the marketplace. The one substantial advantage that we have over everyone else in the marketplace is golf. Golf, in my opinion, is our best target market and where we should be spending our promotional and advertising dollars. Not, we only want golfers to move here, not that, you know, all of the other things that golf is dying, etc. cetera. Um, it just represents a target market that we want to spend our, our advertising dollars toward. Bill? Yes, sir. The, your example of the bell curve is where golf quit being inexpensive here. You know, uh, 10 years ago was the start of more, more golf courses closing than opening. Right. And when that started, then golf prices came down across the country, and we stopped being such a bargain. Yeah. Well, again, I'm not going to get into the individual yeah, and then, details. And also, the, the subsidy got mm -hmm. big, so then we took our prices up, and, and we really then lost our ability to be a part. Yeah, if you look at, at golf, um, I mean, let's look at why we would not choose golf as a target market. Why we would not? Yes. And I'm going to go through some of the myths of that. 
first of all, there's golf rounds are down. Um, some golf courses have closed, but if you really look at the, at the industry and the marketplace, that's typical. It happens in every cycle of things. You know, when Tiger Woods came on board, golf skyrocketed, golf courses were built, more money was spent on golf, and when he quit playing, things have gone down, the golf course have closed. But most of the, the loss is in the lower end of the demographic age spectrum. Uh, the millennials, those people are the ones that are not playing golf. There today is still over 23 million golfers in the United States. Um, golf course, the golf, golfing economy from 2011 until 2016 increased 22.2% or f over 4% annually. This is golf revenue, okay? So golf economy in these studies it is not dying. Um, 2.5 million golfers played golf for the first time. First time, 2.5 million for the first time in 2016. Um, 250,000 golfers retire every year. 25.7 billion dollars was spent on golf tur tourism in 2016. $25 billion, huge market. Golf community, like Hot Springs Village, existing homes in golf communities, has a real estate premium of $2 billion in 2016 versus $1.6 billion in 2011. What that means is that Communities that have golfing assets have grown in value. Their, 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 I guess, disparity or their wideness or the gap between them and other housing is actually grown. So golfing real estate has become more valuable. Um, new home construction in golf communities grew to $7.2 billion in 2016 up from 3.1 billion in 2011. So people are building new homes in golf communities. Okay, um, There has been a decline in golf courses. Um, I think it's mostly, like we talked about before, it's the lower end of the spectrum. There have been people dropped off from playing golf. I think there was just too many golf courses built and the market needs to come back to some realistic level. Um, the number of golfers 65 years and older increased by 13% in the year 2017. Year over year? Yes. The number of non-golfers who said they were interested in taking up golf in 2017 rose to 14.9 million, an all-time high. Okay, this is our pipeline. And 63% of PGA television viewers are 55 years old and older. So golf is a, it, still very healthy as far as a national market. I, I make one point for that too. If you had a choice to bring a golfer here or a person that wanted to live in the woods and didn't golf, you're much better off with a golfer because that's where our dip is coming from. So a golf person versus a non-golf person is going to hopefully help you with your budgets on the golf course. So they're like doubly or triply more important. Well, and if you look at why people call, talk about our rounds being down, okay? Think about this for a second. It, it makes sense that our rounds, number of rounds, would be gone. Think about in, I don't know, I'm just going to pick a number, 2008, and we were selling 300 homes a year. Is that accurate? Pretty close. Okay. Beginning prior to that. Okay, well, let's just round figures. And in 2018, what did we sell? 60. 60. 
These are new rooftops. Okay, new rooftops. New rooftops. Right, rooftops. right. Think about this from a golfing perspective. If the more, majority of these people came into the village at 60, 65 years old, and they were golfers, so all, I don't know, half of them, 150 are out on the golf course playing rounds. As these folks get older, okay, 10 years older now, they're in their 70s, maybe 75, their golfing rounds go down for a variety of different reasons. And what are we putting back in the end of the pipeline? We're only putting 30 golfers back in that pipeline, right? So we've taken a pipe and a revenue stream in the village of 150 new golfers a year, let's say, assuming 50% of the people that build a new home are golfers. I think it's probably more than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we drop that to 30. That's going to kill your golf rounds. I mean, that's natural attrition. You can, you can stand up at 30,000 feet and look at that and go, whoa, I see the problem. We don't have as many golfers here. It's not because there's not interest in golf. It's not because golf is dying. It's because we simply don't, our marketing program is not generating, generating enough sales. There's the market. On the pipeline, uh, golf, definitely, yes, I do. But if that pipeline breaks, you don't know the source. Multi-layering is what we need. Well, in those times when golf will go down, or, uh, you have a recession. Golf will go down a lot during that time. Not that it can't come back. Say so we can shoot, but we need those additional pipelines. We can't be this way. You talk about broad advertising. Yeah. We have to well, have more it, than just a narrow you're right, but right now we need to focus our dollars, okay? And and if we had an unlimited advertising budget, absolutely. Let's advertise to the golfers. Let's advertise to pickleballers. Let's find people that like our trails. You know, let's advertise to people that like lakes. But if you look at those marketing well, like stra the amenities, but I mean, the, like we have retirees. That's actually pipeline. What well, is a pipeline? But think about it. If if I have two people standing here right now, one is a golfer and the other is just a retiree that just wants to sit at his house, the golfer, if he wants to be in the best golf community in the United States, he's coming at least coming here to take a look at us. The retiree, he's got thousands of options across the United States, and his choice then becomes geographical or where the kids live or all sorts of other things. Of life. Yeah. But golf isn't, you know, golf is something. I'm a golfer, or you've got a lot of golfers. We have a great. Okay, let me, re let me restate again. Just because we're targeting golf right. does not mean we don't want anyone else to come and live here. And we have. Well, well it, it's the splash over effect. Think about this for a second. Tormy is in Kansas City. He's 58 years old, and he plays golf every Saturday with his friends. He's got a foursome. They play every Saturday, rain or shine, snow, anything. He's out there because he's a working man, and that's all he has to do. Two things is, number one is, is if you go ask Tormy on the golf course, what is it you plan on doing more of when you retire? Golf. He's going to say golf. He's not going to say, well, I'm going to go on the lake more. I'm going to find some trails that I can go walk and hike on. He's going to say golf. So he's a prime, he's an emotional target market that we want to capture. But golf is such an emotional sport, and people are so involved in golf that what Tommy will do is when he gets the brochures from Hot Springs Village, what do you think he's going to do next Saturday morning at the golf course? He's sharing that information with them three guys, okay? And a part of our marketing process in prospect management should be to grab the prospect on the first call, figure out where their interests are, because they may be interested in golf, they may be interested in lakes or trails or other things. We, we want to welcome everyone, but we want to understand who they are and then we can bring them through the process. Our ultimate marketing goal is to get people here. Okay, once you get people here, we've got them. 
I don't know how many people I've talked to here in the village that have said, I fell in love with this place the first time I came here. I bought a lot or I committed to buying a lot or whatever it was, most people, if we can get them here, will we'll fall in love with the place. So that's our objective. So our sales prospect management process should be designed around getting people here. And we can talk more in detail about that later. But the key is, is that brochure that he has will be shared. And while we've got him on the initial call, we go, Tommy, do you play golf? Tommy says, absolutely. I play every Saturday morning with my three friends. Would you mind, Tommy, if we sent them some brochures as well on Hot Springs Village? Now what's going to happen? Now we've got brochures in four people's houses in Kansas City, Missouri. It's on the coffee table. Mrs. Tormy <laughs> is looking at it. She's looking through the brochure and goes, my God, did you see the lakes? This place has got 10 lakes. And it's got pickleball courts and it's got walking trails. Did you know it's 26,000 acres of wooded? So he, she gets on the phone and calls her neighbor. I know you guys are thinking about retiring. You really need to take a look at this brochure. That's splash over. Golf does that. Golf is an emotional and it puts us at the top of mind. We become the John Deere. We become the Starbucks. We become the leader in everyone's mind because of what we do in golf. Now to quickly answer your question from earlier is the defendability. One of the things that also makes a great target market and a product differentiation is barrier to entry. In other words, how difficult is it for other people to come into your sandbox and do what you do? It's not easy to build nine championship golf courses. Okay, we've got a big lead on the marketplace. We've got a story to tell that will last for years and years and years. Anyone trying to encroach in that space is going to have to spend a ton of money just to get to where we are. Okay, we need to take advantage of that. Um, so, yes, sir. When I was at 7 Eleven, we hired the Burger King guy, the marketing guy. And, and the thing he brought to us, and he said it every day of the year, was you've got to target your heavy user. Yeah. And that's everything you're saying here. Yeah. Is you've got to stick with your heavy user. That's the guy in the pickup truck. Stops, gets a pack of cigarettes, a cup of coffee in the morning, stops and gets a six pack in the afternoon. That's the guy you want. Yep. You don't, you don't want to fool around with anybody else. You want that guy. Perfect example. We had a Burger King out the West Gate. Target 18 to 35 year old males. McDonald's, and, and they rarely had people in there. McDonald's not only targets more of a family oriented group, but they target seniors. They have special deals for seniors and coffee and so they understand the demographics. I don't know, I've heard that they're packed all the time down there now. Oh, every time you drive past okay. the drive through So that's marketing, okay? That's the difference between someone who understands their customer and their target market and someone that's pointed in some other direction. So golf is not only makes us different, gives us a top of mind position in the marketplace, but it also gives us a tremendous pipeline to follow up because all of these people that play golf communicate. And some guy might be 62 and on the brink of retirement today, but a guy who's 53 years old is starting to think about retirement. I know I was. And so he's a perfect guy we want to continue to market towards. So we develop a database. Go ahead. Well, to your point, and the barrier to entry into what we have is financially unacceptable to most places. Oh, yeah. Can't I can't repeat it. it. Yep. Mr. Cooper has given us a gold mine of an opportunity. It is the most, when I took a look at this, I've got. 45 years in marketing, I have a degree in marketing, I've taught marketing at college level, um, I've had my own marketing school, and I've marketed for, been involved with marketing for Fortune 500 companies down to very small companies. 
I have never seen an opportunity like we have in front of us. It's exciting. I mean, it, it, and it just differentiates us so uniquely into the marketplace, into a market that's exploding. I mean, the baby boomers are coming out at 10,000 a day. I calculate those even with all the diminished numbers in golf at 700 a day. So there's 700 golfers retiring every day. And we're the king. We've got the best product in the marketplace for those sort of people. We talked about the splash over. We also have a ton of free marketing dollars in our marketing tank, okay? When you look at a marketing strategy and you look at money we have to spend, of course, we run an ad in Golf Digest or Golf Weekly or on the Golf Channel or, and I'm not promoting any marketing specifically or advertising specifically, but whoever we advertise to, those are money we have to write a check for today. We have free marketing dollars in our tank. And what those are, are golf rounds, okay? We've already paid for that. We've paid for the fertilizer and the green fees and the people and, and all the things that go along with that. So why not use that in a creative way to get people to come to the village? Remember, we talked about if we can just get people here, they're hooked. We get people here and we give them a free round day one on Granada and a second one at Isabella on day two. You take them to Mr. Hollinsworth over there and Jane and those people will rope them up with a new house in, in a matter of minutes. <laughs> or Lloyd Sherman. Yeah, don't forget Lloyd. Hallelujah, <laughs> <love> brother. <laughs> yeah, trying to spread it around. I'd like to uh, second your motion that Hot Springs Village is a gold mine. Yeah, it is. It's a gold mine. It I mean, for many ways, but from a marketing opportunity, it's a, it's a gold mine. There are so many cross-marketing opportunities here. I've Think about this for a second. What if we created a package? First of all, there's a whole tournament marketing program that we could implement. I'm not even going to get into that because that's really detailed and it's based upon a lot of factors, but it's very real and possible and would, I think, over time, basically freeze our PO, POA fees where they are now. But another opportunity is the cross-marketing we have with all the golfing communities out there. The PGA, the USGA, uh, Callaway Golf, um, all want to stimulate golf. They're looking for promotional programs where we can joint market with them and maybe we give around a couple rounds of golf and maybe Callaway throws in a sleeve of golf balls and maybe ship sticks cuts the shipping charges by 50% on getting their golf clubs. I don't know. But there's a lot of people in the golf industry that we can use as marketing partners in this sort of thing. You look back at May and Company in Ohio and the things that they did back then. They got involved with the which one of the stamp programs? It wasn't green stamp. It was the uh, S and H. That's green stamps. Yeah. I don't remember now. Top value. Did they get top value? I, I don't. But what they did is they were then they, they 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 developed the program, which brought them closer to their customers, which is a part of marketing 101. You want to embrace your customer, know your customer, love your customer. But then they went out and they cross marketed that. They offered those the same stamp program through one of the grocery stores there. I've got the name here. Oh, was it Bohax? No. So you're a lot older than we are. Sticks Berry Fuller. Eagle Stamp Program. Eagle Stamp. Okay. And they did that. Sticks Berry and Fuller and, and um, Famous Bar and some of those big stores like that in the St. Louis area. Pack and Pay, they did a co-marketing program with. Again, they developed their synergies together. We have all of those same opportunities in the golfing community. The industry is full of people that would be willing to work with us. On that same vein, we have a tremendous marketing opportunity into the corporate world. If, if you're Traveler's Insurance and you want to have your annual salesman meeting, 
or president's club or president's or club or sales stars or whatever it happens to be why not package that around the golfing community we are missing the lodging portion of this and, and i've got some ideas on that we can talk about later but um but it's a great cross-marketing opportunity, and it's a way to build those revenues. And, and we start out small, and we get more next year, and the more the following year, and eventually you get enough revenue in here where we don't have to worry about maintenance or, or POA fees going up or, or any other unseen costs that come our way. It's, it's a part of marketing. Yes, sir? <clears throat> Furthermore, to answer your question back there a little more, you can target areas. We tend to know where our people tend to come from. So Golf Magazine, I looked it up today, you got all kinds of regional opportunities. Yeah, so absolutely, can, good point. And get deeper into the, the call. This is not to say you couldn't run into a fishing magazine. We've got some of the greatest lakes opportunities with the small red. And the big thing is you need an expanded online fishing expedition to get people because that's really what turbocharges you know and follow social media is certainly a part of, of the overall advertising strategy you know out here one thing I did not list was social media I've spent a lot a lot of time in the last four or five months studying Facebook and, and studying Facebook marketing and it's actually incredible media to be able to target specific groups, demographic groups, groups that like golf as an example. But some of the traditional media is good as well. Um, for example, Golf Week magazine. The average reader of that is 53 years old. That's the start of our pipeline, okay? So we can build that kind of name recognition, that image, that brand, if you will, into that marketplace because it, it exists. Okay. Can I ask a question about Troon? Wasn't Troon supposed to be our golf savior? And how do you feel about Troon as one of our marketing sources? Well, first of all, I don't know anything about Troon or our agreement with them um, or what they were proposed to do, so I really can't answer that. But I do believe Troon um, was a golfing solution. If it's working, not working, I have no idea. Um, but, you know, my comment would be, if rounds are going down, it's probably not working as well as we would like it to. And, and why, without me going inside of it and tinkering around in the engine, I wouldn't, wouldn't know why, because I wouldn't know what they were doing. So we go back to the building blocks of this marketing plan, and who we are and our target are the first two things that we need to figure out. So, if I were recommending something for the board to take a look at, that's where I would start. Is go through whatever exercise you need to, but figure out who we are and who we should be targeting. Again, not from who we want to live here, but who are we going to direct our advertising dollars. Because if we spend, if we've got an advertising budget of $400,000 a year, if we spend all of that in the golf marketplace targeting golfers, we'll get a much better to return than if we try and spend 50000 here, and 75,000 here and 28,000 here to all different groups because our message becomes diluted. Again, the brand in the marketplace becomes diluted because we want the marketplace to believe we are our retirement community. And ultimately, we can't fool the customer. You know, we can say we're Disneyland, or we can say we're whoever we are and advertise that all over the place. You're not going to fool the customer. If you bring people here through your advertising and promotion under, I don't know, we'll call it false pretenses, but, it, but, but 
to deliver a product that we can't deliver. In other words, if we say we do X, Y, and Z, and they come here and they see we don't do X, Y, and Z, it's, you're tearing up the brand. That will travel like wildfire, wildfire, especially in today's social media. If you do something bad in today's social media, man, it, it's like light and gasoline. So another key part of the marketing strategy is you need to deliver. Who we are, what we target, and what our product is has to be what the customer receives when they get here, A, and B, it needs to be what they get for as long as they live here. So if you're making product promises of a certain type, once people live here, we need to continue to deliver that product. You, you can't give them something different and expect them to be happy. Happy customers are the best marketing tool that anyone can have, any kind of business can have. So we must make sure we deliver that product. What time is it, by the way? Seven? Seven. Okay, thank you. I got it, thank you. My shill in the back was gonna start jumping up and down when she was seven, and I see her putting her jacket on, so. <laughs> Active lifestyle retirement community that is the best golfing destination for retirees in America. Yep. With all the other benefits, 26,000 acres, 10 lakes, pickleball courts, blah, 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 okay? What the CMP, the, the, the problem with the CMP, in, in addition to it tried to solve the, the incorrect problem, which, which really was product differentiation as opposed to figuring out a way to develop more of the village, it's built on what I consider a ineffective marketing strategy. As you can see here, we build the marketing plan first. Who we are, what our target market is, build our marketing plan on top of it, where are we gonna advertise, how are we gonna handle the leads when they come in, all of those sort of things. And then our development plan, like the CMP, goes on top of that. Because everything we develop is going to have to answer back to the marketing program somewhere because those are the people that are going to come here to buy it. What it appears that the CMP did, again, no fault to any, any and, and this is no fault to any past directors or managers or whatever, this is exactly how many, many business people look at this because I've given this presentation so many times and people have made similar strategic decisions but basically, we created the CMP, which was going to solve our problems from development from lots and, and develop the village, and then we inserted the marketing plan inside there. Okay, to make the CMP work, how do we, who do we need to market this to? Okay, and so that's when we created, in my opinion, the strategy to divert some of our advertising from the retirees and go after the Millennials and the Gen Xers and, and the other people. Again, not meaning they shouldn't live here, we shouldn't promote them coming here, they're welcome here, love them. It's how do we target ourselves and target the promotion. The CMP w was directed, it found its target market as a result of what it wanted to do from a development plan, which is exactly the opposite of how a Fortune 500 company develops its marketing strategy. It starts out with who are we, who is our target market, how do we sell them, how do we bring them here, then once they're here how do we develop villages that fit that target market and fit that strategy. So if you looked at development things like a lodge makes perfect sense, okay? That would be something I would promote as a development project. Pickleball is not out of the question for development. I am not anti-pickleball. It's just not one of our central marketing themes. If you look at pickleball, there's a lot of pickleball courts around the country, and we have nice ones, but we're not the paramount pickleball place in the country. But we could be. So part of our development strategy might be, where did she go? Man, I was coming around to answer her question, and she left. Um, might be that we move we develop other target markets within there. Once we become really strong in the golf community and we've got a full pipeline of people coming in here, 
okay? We can then maybe build new pickleball facilities that are all enclosed and 40,000 square feet and lighted and food centers inside and everything else, and we become the pickleball king of the retirement community in the United States. Then we can market that separately, whether we would or should or couldn't is another thing. What does this mean ultimately for the village? Here's, here's how I look at things. When I plan businesses and do plans for business, I start with the big picture first. In other words, if, if we sat down and had our druthers and we could say, what do we want Hot Springs Village to be? We're gonna, let's create the ideal village. Most people would say, if we had the money, I would prefer that it not get much more crowded. In other words, we can continue building and bringing more people in here, but eventually roads get more crowded, you need stoplights, it becomes more difficult to get a court at the tennis center, it, rounds of golf become more difficult. I don't know when that is, or if it's in five years or 20 years, who knows. But to me, the ideal village is what would we like the ideal village to be? And to me, I like the village this size. I mean, I enjoy the traffic. I can enjoy driving at night and there's nobody around. I mean, but the problem is, is we need money, okay? So what I would do is I, if I were the village, I would build a plan that said, number one, I would target the number of homes we want to build. Totally. In other words, let's say we want 11,726 homes. That's our, that's our target. And so we build a, a plan, a marketing plan that figures out how many more homes that needs, uh, how, how much advertising and promotion we need to bring them in. Number two is whatever that is, let's say it's over seven years. Our second marketing pr challenge would be to create amenity revenue that covers the difference. In other words, over this seven year period, the, the amenity revenue begins increasing each year. So maybe through tournaments, maybe through pickleball tournaments, maybe fishing tournaments, I don't know all of the different things, but the goal would be to have this increasing so that we eventually don't have to build new homes to pay our bills. What happens then with property values? They go up. Yeah, because they go up? Yeah. Absolutely, they go up. So if I were developing a plan, what I would say is two things. How can we keep the village kind of how it is now? And how can we increase our property values? How can we make our properties worth more money? I mean, you look at the, the communities of the world that have the most real estate value. It's like Manhattan and Malibu and La Jolla. Those are all relatively fixed environments that... That's right, they're dirt, but they're dirt where you can't build anymore or there's an extreme amount of value. You can't build a home on the ocean any longer. They're already all built up. We have a similar opportunity here to increase property values over a seven-year plan or a nine-year plan or a 14-year plan. Again, I'm talking in generalities now. That's what I would do. And so that's a sensible strategy. How we get there, or if that's the plan that the, you and the board decide on, it's fine. What I can guarantee you is any plan you do, it has to start with your target market, who we are, and the target market, and then your marketing plan, and then you can add all your other stuff on top of that. Last conclusion. So the marketing deals with everything from awareness of the customer, identifying who we are, who the market thinks we are, till they get the product, and for many years after they live here. I gotta say, well, no, I'm not gonna say that. Um, but we need the right target market, 
we need the right product and we need the right message, which all goes along with this. And then the right customer management and, and sales process along the way. Questions? Dick? I think you left out a big P, the, the price. If you told a customer what it costs to buy a house per square foot, what the HOA fees are, what the property tax is, what your utility bills are, you've made a very strong argument for your product. Yeah, I, I, I thought I, <coughs> I thought I did say that about the price. It, it is really you're right. It's the value of living here, the cost of living. It's the POA fees. Uh, it's what you get for what you pay for. Yeah, real estate, housing costs, absolutely. If you live in California and you look at, at this place, uh, you got to move here. He said it was a myriad of things. Yeah, the only thing I said is this is something we really have no control over within the marketing plan. The price is going to be the price. The marketing plan. Well, why can't you put that in the marketing plan? Oh, you can. You should. You should have that a part. And it should be a part of our brochures. When we send a brochure out to Torming as three golfers. Oh, it should be on our website. Yeah, it should be on our website. You know, Absolutely. And to his point, if I looked at the house I left in Chicago, it wasn't, this one I bought here is a little bit more money. If I had duplicated this house in Chicago on a golf course like I'm on, it would have been a million five. The house I had in Chicago was maybe 400000 the taxes were three times as much. Yeah. And everything, and take, go in, you can talk about electric bills. It's about 10 cents per kilowatt hour here. In Chicago, it's 15 cents per kilowatt hour. It is a golden opportunity. It's what I said before. We have the best marketing opportunity right here. When you gave your first presentation, I was sitting next to a gentleman in the front row. And... Um, I kicked myself for not getting his name, but he, we were talking and he said, uh, you know, we're a golf community, we should target golf. And I wish I'd got his name because I thought about that over the next few days and it just seemed like the light bulb went on. Now, right tonight, I feel like I've been given a pep talk. I'm 30 years old. I want to stand up and say, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is strictly my opinion. We've been property owners for 20 years. Cooper had a wonderful marketing plan. Brought people in here. Look how quickly we developed. We have been hamstrung with very subpar management. Our, my opinion, our upper level management is not selected or hired by experience, by education. They're hired by longevity and who they're friends with. There are no new ideas coming in, and we could have the best marketing plan in the world, but we have subpar people trying to do the job, in my opinion. Uh, and I appreciate that. I, I, I'm not going to go there. My, yeah. I can tell you what they did and how they acted is how most people act in this similar situation. So um, I, I cannot fall people for what they've done, the decisions that they've made. No. What I'm talking about is where do we go from today? What, what do we, where do we move from from here? Well, let, let me make a, a comment, great example. I was active in the Garland County Senior Golf Association. We played at about six different courses. Why didn't we play at Hot Springs Village? Mm -hmm. Well, our director of golf says, I have to be guaranteed this many people at this price or y'all can't come. There was a multitude of people living in these surrounding communities. Once they got in here and found out what we had, they would be here. But we are so narrow-minded that we can't see it. I just want to add something. Let me, let me just, Jeff, yeah. yeah. go ahead, Jeff. First of all, thank you for, for what you've done here tonight because I think this is kind of zero-basing the ideas the way you have here, I think, causes us to kind of think, uh, look at things differently, and I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Having sold real estate for the last 30 years in the village, one of the things that you said rings a bell with me is, when people come through the gates, they like the product. If we can get them through the gates, it's a win. We can show them something they like, whether it's golf or something else that they like. But since Cooper's been doing it, and since we've been doing it, past, you know, post Cooper, we've been bringing people in the gates two people at a time. They've been driving in a car, mom and dad have been driving through the car, explore the village, like what they see, invest in the village. 
and uh, you were going to hit on this, and I'm interested in your comments on it. But my, I think the gold mine that we, perhaps the gold mine that we have that's the greatest opportunity that we haven't uh, exploited is the wholesale approach to selling the village. We're bringing in people, you know, two at a time. But if you had, you know, Paul Bridges sitting right here, if he brought the Rotary Club, uh, the regional conference for the Rotary Club into the village, mixed a little golf, a little bit of lakes, a little bit of trails, but had some fun, but also did some Rotary business, we'd bring in 200 people. They would all be exposed. If we brought in the Baptist Convention into the village and they played golf and did the same, you know, you'd have that. If you brought in the Methodists, if you brought in the family reunions, if you brought in the um, the, the corporate retreats out of Dallas alone would be hundreds and hundreds and thousands yeah. of people. Yeah. If we know that for sure when they come through the gates, they're going to like what they see, and I think they do because we've proven that over and over again, why not stop bringing two people at a time and bring wholesale groups? Now, I can tell you that I, I wanted to try this out and understand you know, what the villages of, Flor of, of Florida were doing, perhaps different than us. So my wife and I took a trip down there not too long ago, and we went on a bicycle trip, and there was 200 cyclists there for that weekend, for that three days. All 200 of us got exposed to the villages of Florida. And why did that happen so easily? Because we stayed at their lodge, okay? And then right after we left, a whole other group of people came in to stay at their lodge. And I'm just saying, there's a way to approach this thing from a wholesale standpoint that I think will ramp this thing up exponentially. Yeah. Um, and if we got to start thinking that way, and I agree with you, the development, if, if we're going to do any type of development in here to begin with, I think it ought to be, um, you know, either find outside investors or even, I mean, I've advocated for the POA taking out, you know, perhaps even um, a note, you know, a loan to, and participate with the village and, and do something that would be, a, you know, that would set us apart on a wholesale basis. Uh, I agree. Hello. Totally. And, and I know we could walk into a, a Hilton or someone and convince them of the opportunity here. We might be able to have to joint venture it with other investors from outside. This would be an easy deal for me to sell. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like, what, what do you have to lose? Look at the potential, look at the numbers. Look at the number of people that you would come, could come through. 200 clubs. I sat in a room with two with the club presidents of 200 clubs when we did this, uh, the POA about four years ago, did a uh, kind of a study to see whether a lodge would work. So they put us all, it was actually in this, it was uh, right outside here in the auditorium. Sat us all around in a room and, and went to each board president uh, or each president of each club and said, hey, who could you bring in? How often could you bring in? How many would come? And they went around the room. It was absolutely mind-blowing to see, you know, just the creativity that started happening within those, the, the 200 clubs we have here in the village. All of, almost to a person, they said that they could bring in wholesale groups of people. Yeah. And every one of those is a prospect either today or part of the pipeline. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. To the Nancy, I'll okay. All right. First off, I'd like to say thank you to our three new board members for being here. Uh, by the way, Cindy, Cindy Erickson is here as well. Thank you, Cindy. So thank you, but our three new board members are here, and I, I personally hope that you've listened. You, you, you've got everything going in your little minds, and that <laughs> even if you find We are real little confident with that. Hey, 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 you are doing fine in your left comment. I'm so cool. sorry. I didn't mean little minds. I meant, <laughs> we, we are. okay, your little minds. So stay, keep on going. Any rate, that you do pay attention to this, and that it makes sense. I think everybody in this room, it makes sense to, to follow this, something like it, but then to be able to take it back to the other board members and help them try to understand that there is a new way of doing things that makes a lot of sense for us in this village. And like you said, Mr. Phil, we are who we are. We're a retirement community. Marcy. I was going to ask you, would you agree either on one or two things? The Regarding the CMP, I, actually, I absolutely agree with you that it's in the wrong order, it's going the wrong direction, but also the CNP 
Um, and everybody needs a plan. So a comprehensive plan is not a bad thing and not a bad thing to budget for or whatever, but it not only says I'm going to diversify my marketing dollars, but then I'm going to take other money and build things for those markets that we're going towards that are not here yet. That aren't here yet. Yeah. So that's that's twice as much money that's going away from what the target yeah. market. Is. Plus, it's eroding our brand. Exactly. And and and, and, and it, I mean. It so you agree make, with that? Yeah, I would agree, okay. and it doesn't make sense to me. But I'm not gonna. To the board yeah. members that are here, I don't think I have to say anything to them. Their presence speaks for itself mm -hmm. to me. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. That's it. And the second thing, to this gentleman's point, the talent, it's unfortunate that it seems to be closed out, but it can't all be in the POA. But the talent is in our village. Oh, yeah. think, think about it. We have people that have reached the crescendo of yeah, their experience. Yeah. And we have somebody probably in every avenue who I, can I agree them. totally. And and I congratulate the three board members, but, but I also Thanks, congratulate Cindy because I don't know if you noticed it or not, but Cindy has been one of the people that is relatively open minded. When mm -hmm. when we had seminars specifically on the declarations and John Cooper set up, she was right there in the front row, okay? So she's, she's willing to get involved and open her mind, and I'm hoping at least look at this from a positive standpoint. So I think we deserve to do this. She just wanted to hear you talk about John Deere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to uh, kind of make a, this is factual. There are only, there's only one amenity marketing stream, revenue stream, that can help the village financially, and that is golf. Mm -hmm. So golf should be our target. Mm -hmm. It's the third largest revenue stream as we speak. The first one is assessments, the second one is utilities, mm -hmm. the third one is golf, and they're big. You could bring in 500 pickleball players and financially it's not going to make a big di difference. But so you know what, what he's saying and he's written some documents on so there are very good. You bring in one new rooftop going to what you said. It brings you at most $800 more a year in assessment revenue but maybe half of that if they were already paying the assessment on the lot that they owned, okay? Right. But they didn't bill on. So it gets you let's say incrementally $400, right? But if that one person out of the two plays two rounds a week, it gets you, I think, it, what, last time I counted, it, about twelve, about fifteen hundred dollars a year. Yeah. Yeah. So it gets you, in effect, three to four to five times as much revenue as the assessment. And it doesn't take too many years of building two or three hundred houses if we could get there to solve every problem we could imagine. Right? Absolutely. My area of concern that I have is the availability that we, I mean, I really, we've 26,000 acres. Yes, it is, it's wonderful, we got lots of land. However, in my opinion, the available ability of our premium lots, our golf courses, when I play golf, there's not a whole lot of empty lots on the golf courses. Right. And when I go on the lakes, there's not a whole lot of empty lots on the lakes. I mean, th those are what I would consider premium lots. And perhaps, you know, Jeff is in a better position to help me understand this, but I'm having a hard time getting my, my, my little mind, <laughs> my little mind around this, uh, you know, I, I recognize the need of, of uh, how, that we've got to grow the village. We, we, we really need, you know, maybe if we could get another 3,500 residents, if you would, another, another, well, if we drop to your, to, to your point, on all the golf courses, if you looked at how many signs are up for sale for blank lots, it's 60. Now, there's a lot more than 60 lots that are open that don't have houses on them around the village, but they're owned by someone like you, maybe, who maybe someday will build, maybe they won't. What well, part of our strategy should be, how do we get houses on those premium lots, or in some way make the value of them go up 
such that I own one. I may never move here, but I'll sell it now but, but because I, I can make some money. I also want to finish off with one other thing. How does our marketing plan that we have, we have another subset of property owners out there, and those are our non-resident property owners. How do they fit into here? Because they could certainly make a difference. I understand they own a lot. But they could certainly make a difference if they came here and built on a lot. Yeah. Or sold to somebody. That, I have an answer for that. It's a 30 minute answer. Okay. And so I, I'm not going to so go into it. But here's the key. <laughs> is, tell me, ask, what happens when these property values start going up? What, is, what are the non-resident property owners going to do? They're, they're going to sell or they're going to build. or A lot of people that bought those lots here in the village bought it as an investment. They looked at this and go, man, this is going to be worth something someday and I'm going to buy this lot. They didn't listen to the line on Cooper's sales document that said that you shouldn't be buying it. Yeah, <laughs> and I think probably a lot of people that have stopped paying POA fees as they've looked at this as an investment and says, it's not worth putting that kind of money into this if it's not going to go up in value. But you start increasing value on those lots, I think you'll see a different mindset. Second thing is, is your question is, I'll bet half of the golfers here in the village don't live on lake lots or golf course lots. Okay, okay. so golfers will come in here, they'll, I mean, they can live and buy anywhere, for that matter, and still be a golfer. And still will be attracted by the village they may because not of that. want to pay the premium price that a golf lot or a lake like. Or maybe they can. But they still want yeah, to play golf. Maybe they can. I mean, it's yeah. if we could bring Californians in here. Yeah. I mean, we we be mega rich. But we may. We're bringing people in from Kansas City and other areas that aren't as. I'm going to ask a question about golf subsidy because I believe that I did not come here to I have was doing five six rounds a week. In Chicago, so I did not come here to pay retail prices on golf. But the current marketing strategy is to keep upping the prices of rounds, which doesn't make me happy. Well, okay, I I don't know if that's the current marketing strategy, um, but I recognize that as, as an effort. Well, the fees have gone up. In the they last have, three but years. but I recognize it as an effort of. You know we're here, and and revenue is going down, or it's stabilizing. What do we do? Well, one of the things you you do is you've got to increase amenity fees. But I mean, all the important to make sure that they stay. <laughs> well, it takes level. X amount of dollars well, to run the place. I, I, yeah, I think you've got to protect the main asset. If you're going to choose golf as your target market, you need to protect that yeah. uh, more than anything. But I think the plan, the entire plan, and the strategy working cohesively will solve all of those problems. And to, to her point, last year we didn't, this year we didn't raise the golf rates. We stayed flat. And I would like to think that would continue in the future. But we had, and to be attractive to these other golfers, we have to be market competitive at minimum, and hopefully maybe a little less than the, mar the average price, which, and I think in many cases we are, a study needs to be done on that and not just to what the golf courses around here, the 50 mile radius are, that might give you one answer, but ones, for example, that are in some t target markets you yeah. want to pursue, like and if we, you find out that golf. the average price for golf in Chicago, which I don't know, is $200 a round, well, yeah. we're fine, I know it's not. Yeah. <laughs> you, could find, you could find out we're probably okay, but then if you found out in California was $20 a round, well, that'd give you a different yeah. message. And it's, it's a matter of perception yeah. and, and, and where people come from, but it, again, it's all about marketing and how you position that, and, and there's a great book, if any of you ever have a chance to read it, called Positioning. It's written by um, two guys, Trout and Reese. R-E-I-S, I believe is how you spell his last name. And it's about marketing as a, as a mental concept. In other words, how do we as consumers rank products in our mind? How do we look at buying decisions? Those sort of things. And, and it's about perception. It's totally about our job is not to sell the product, it's to manage the perception. And that's exactly what you're talking about, perception. Yes, sir? I want to say that we're the most successful, unsuccessful venture I've ever seen. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because looking at your numbers on the golf, 
and looking at how the village is, village is built out, we could clearly exist at our current level on 50 to 60 percent of the land and be fine, and we would likewise have less golf courses, less lakes, less everything, and we'd be just as comfortable. But, but we're not that. We've got this massive amount of uh, property, and we're trying to figure out, and the reason the golf rounds have gone up is because of those numbers, plain and simple. You have to charge more. Now, that doesn't necessarily address the market, so it shows how imperative in the next few years that our marketing is going oh, to be. It's extremely imperative, and, and it's why I've been pounding the table for a year uh, about this, is, is I see this every month that we go by and we don't get on the right marketing train is, is a waste. We're losing money, we're tarnishing our brand, we're missing opportunities, and ultimately every one of those is possible. But it has to be a part of the overall strategy. And I, I, sir. I'd like to bring up one thing. Arkansas, that's what everybody I told when I moved here from Colorado. <laughs> okay? So, and I love your ideas about marketing here. I worked on Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. In Milwaukee. Okay. Wisconsin. And so, He's a and I, 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 which, by the way, has the largest state party here. Well, it did. Texas is And Texas is second. I mean, there's a lot. I, I worked in advertising, marketing, co op stuff, Budweiser, Amico, all those kinds of things. And we need to bring everybody together. The Remax is the world, Cooper. We have a lot of partners, the state. And we, we did the advertising for the state of Wisconsin. We won it. I was on the winning team. And it was the key to the winning team. And I still think the agency still has it. So well, I, I also think playing on the value of living here, uh, golf, obviously, but the value and the, and, uh, you know, you don't want to, you, you got to lose word, words out like cheap and all that, but, but the value sure. of living here, I mean, on Fox News today and this afternoon, they were saying the least expensive gasoline in the United States was a gas station in Bryant, Arkansas. Smetco. Okay, and I was like, there's the value again, it just over and over again, you know, whether it's the renewals on your driver's license or whatever. So those sorts of things need to be part and parcel to that. And, and, and the Arkansas designation that we all live within was a challenge we probably most of us faced when we came here. So I submit to you that a free round of golf to a guy will get him to come to Arkansas. Once he comes into our 26,000 acres, he's lost sight of Arkansas. He's found heaven. That's the way I felt when I came. But we got to get out of just working inside the state. Oh yeah, we've got to. It's got to be a nationwide no, advertising. Not nationwide. Yeah, it has to be nationwide. We naturally draw people from because that's money's. You don't need to. Well, I came here from Colorado. Is that too far west? Well, that's where we, we came from. Okay. Well, then we. It's a national. You look at you California. You pay a lot of money to to be there. You I can run it. I can run an ad on Facebook for three hundred dollars that will reach over a hundred thousand people that that have golfing designation somewhere in them. So it used to be that way. So if you had to run a national. TV ad or, or a magazine ad, you're 100% right. There you need to select regions because of the cost of media. But that doesn't mean we can't spread our marketing tentacles through other media all across the United States. Because what we want to do is we also want to build that pipeline of people that are thinking someday about coming. I'm not disagreeing with that, but the synergy is, is focused. Uh, There's synergy between normal advertising like in golf magazines where you get somebody's attention, as well as online. In fact, I talked to an online uh, agency out of Colorado just this morning. Good point. Yes, ma'am. I just like to think outside the box of their lodging. You know, we don't have a hotel that can, you know, give us a lot right now. But there is a lot in in, in Hot Springs that is coming on the pipeline with the, maybe where the Majestic is being built a new resort if you're following what's going on with that building there so that we have the ability to bring people up certainly and that's only 20 miles away yeah. the second part of that is I'd like to see us marketing more in the village and having people use their houses as Airbnbs 
people really enjoy using that venue for their stays all over the country, all over the world. And I don't think it's legal here to actually have your house as an Airbnb. I know people are doing it, but there's no reason we couldn't have hundreds of people, you know, utilizing their houses when you bring them in for groups. Great, Airbnb, great suggestion. Airbnb. That's a, all a part of the, the prospect management, sales distribution strategy. But you have my whole point tonight is to communicate that we have to start with who we are and the right target market. Okay. Then everything else becomes good ideas, and that is a good idea. I mean, there's many, many good ideas out here about what to do. Go ahead. I have a question for you that you triggered my mind. Okay. I go on the internet and I type in TG, TGW because they had a good sale for golf balls. Half the time after that, when I log into my email account, I get an ad on their golf balls. Yes. So they, somebody knows I've looked at golf balls and knows I'm a prospect. Google your search engine, whatever right. that was. So how expensive is it then for the every party in the country, for example, to get that blasted onto their, when they log into their email system? Is That's it right. hugely it's expensive or cheap? It's cheap. Is that search engine optimization? Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's about... That has to do with ranking. In other words, yeah. if he types in TGW, it brings up Tom and Jerry's warehouse. And, okay. and yeah. but, but what he's talking about is they'll link you. Like, I, I'll do a search on my laptop, and then later on on my cell phone, ads from that company pop up on yeah. there. Okay, that's all a part of marketing. And they, they have keywords, and they look at the things that you're interested in, products that you're interested in. And they turn around and sell those ads. So could you use that's that what database and trigger an ad. To absolutely, pop up Hot Springs Village. And absolutely, it, and I would suspect it's pretty inexpensive. You could go. You could go right now run an ad in Facebook to everybody that looked up Dick Sporting Goods Golf on the internet last week. And then filter by free. zip by, code. Yeah, by zip code and or by. You know, are there other golfing references in their in their Facebook post? Did they mention while well, I'm going to the Masters this year? Or yeah, why variety of different things? Firm that knows how to do it. We need a we need a national advertising and marketing agency that understands that. Yes, sir. Well, we're about to embark upon a 50th anniversary celebration. Is that not a phenomenal tool, phenomenal. a machine, to really build this place for 12 months? The the other marketing thing that happens down here in promotion, in addition to ads and websites and brochures and social media, is, is one is public relations. In other words, public relations is stories that someone else writes about you. Ads are what we say about ourselves. Public relations is what other people say about us. But within the public relations category is the stories that we have to tell. The story of Mr. Cooper and how he started the village our 50-year anniversary, and all the things we've done, and the development, etc. Perfect story. It's a, it's a huge marketing opportunity. I know Dick is very high on this. We've had discussions about it before. Yes, sir? I'd like to uh, jump on that because uh, April the 20th will be our 49th annual anniversary. We're having a get-together at the Balboa Beach April 20th at noon. So please, everybody, come. No advertising. <laughs> and by the way, I've heard of it. I am not running for the board. I'm not going to come back and ask for any money for a consulting or anything like that. I'm, this is all free. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Two things. Um, She's going to say I'm not worth free. If Jody could, <laughs> you know just an expensive. Um, if Jody could um, comment on your question about the original intent of the, because I believe it was a re, as a retirement community, but can you? Was it? Okay. It was. It was. So that's the end of the well, I, I only say that because I, some of the things I've seen was that it was really a kind of a lifestyle family community no, according uh, initially, to and, and that makes sense. Yes. But okay, so it was really originally a retirement community. We originally sold lots. To say, you know, come down, you can enjoy all these amenities later in life, you can live here, you yeah. can, you know, retire and John's here. And like that, so forth. But my but there's a lot of lifestyle in there, yeah. too. 
My other question was, how do you fit the word brand or branding into all of this? Is well, like branding, brand is actually two things. It's what the market ultimately decides you are, but it's also the message that you sell along with your advertising and, you and your marketing. The same. And you hope that they end up being the same. Yes. Um, for example, um, you know, Apple is a brand. Okay, they tie if I if I draw a little apple on on the thing and ask you what company that is, most people are going to say Apple because they recognize it. Companies have brands. Some of the brands connect via the images that they have as a part of their logos and what's called equity statements or positioning statements. Like UPS used to be, we're the tightest ship in the shipping business. And MasterCard used to have one that said uh, um, priceless. Do you remember that one, priceless? Very emotional campaign. They linked it to a uh, a father and a son at a baseball game, and they're eating a hot dog. And the hot dog says, "That hot dog's four ninety-five." And the kid's eating popcorn. That popcorn's six twelve. But a father at a baseball game, priceless. Okay, yes. that's a brand that they created and supported through their advertising. With the swish up, and we all know it's Nike. With the swish up, and we know it's Nike. So, so those we, are brand. That's the visual representation. Brand. Brand. The brand we want to have is the greatest reti golfing retirement community in America. But we create that, we want then the reinforcement of that is working. It's yes. The perception that comes back to us. And, and here's what happens. What I would do is I believe when a call comes in or a written response comes in from an ad, all your advertising should have a call to action. Call now, write in now, call this number, get on the internet, do this, whatever. It should have a call to action. When that lead comes in, in my opinion, it should go to a central place. It shouldn't be an operator who's just saying, okay, I'll send you an information package and writes their name down and sends it. It needs to go to a central place with salespeople. Yeah, and I don't mean arm twisting, you know, stuff them in a room, don't let them out <laughs> type of a sales process. I'm talking about a, a welcoming process of helping these people learn more about the village. The first thing you do, I would have them do, is fill out a questionnaire with these people over the phone. The reason is this. The more we can learn about a prospect, the better in a position we are to sell them something. Okay, so on that questionnaire is going to be things like, "How did you hear about the village?" You know, in other words, which which ad are you responding to? Because we want to track these leads. If you track your leads religiously, you end up getting a documentation exactly of how your advertising is working. So you'll end up going, well, we've got media A, media B, and media C, and media A cost us $45 of advertising per sale, but media B only cost us six. We've now got some more advertising dollars to spend. Where do we want to spend those, okay? If you don't track your leads, you have no idea what media is producing, what kind of results. But on this questionnaire, the salespeople would know their ultimate goal is getting them to come here to visit, right? Because we all agreed, we get them here, they fall in love, they become lot owners. So we want to find out what's their interest. You know, you responded to the ad, do you golf? You know, Mrs. Smith, do you play pickleball? How about, well, you know, all of the different things we have, and you find out who they are and what they stand for. We have some golf packages here, Mrs. Smith. Would you think you and your husband would be interested to come here for a weekend if we provided you a couple free rounds of golf? Either yes or no, maybe not, no, not right now, we're just thinking about it or looking around, whatever that happens to be. But all of these questions and answers go into a database. So three months from now, Mrs. Smith calls back in and we know all there is to know about Mrs. Smith. If you look at sales psychology, Jeff Hollinsworth knows this, but if you look at sales psychology, there's a distinct difference in a prospect's mind in a, in, in a 
educational sale environment to once they've had the education. So on the first call, she's willing to tell you about where her aunt retired and all the fun they have in golf and oh yeah, we've got a pontoon boat and that'd be really nice on the lakes. But once you've given her all the information and she's looked at a couple of houses with Jeff and Jane, you call her up and she's got her defenses up now. Okay. So when we want to get all this information is on the first call. Now when they come to visit here, we manage that process. So we know, what are they looking at, at building? Are they looking at buying? Are they looking at just visiting? Do they like lakes? Does maybe the wife play pickleball? So when they come here, we can structure a tour for them of exactly where we want to take them. So while Fred is out playing 18 holes of golf with Tormy, we can take his wife to the pickleball court or to the workout center or to the woodlands okay or to maybe her and the kids to a beach at Balboa Balboa Lake and I want to say those salespeople are not necessarily real estate salespeople They're no no because sales. here's what here's what happens next is if you find a prospect who's interested now and says yeah I, I want to talk to somebody today then Goes we sell them, send them off to the realtors, okay? We have a realtor organization, I'm not going to name any specific ones here, board. but we, we, we have, realtors. yeah, we decide how those leads are going to be handled. And then we, we ask for feedback. Our only, our only requirement from who we hand the leads off is we want to know what happened to those leads. We want to know, are they coming, where they came? What was their interest? We need a person that manages that entire process. So we kind of know what they're doing. Because the next thing we want to do is after they go home, what do we want to do? We want to follow up. How did you enjoy the village? Did you, did you get a chance to see the pickleball courts? What did you think of the tennis center? Blah, 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 blah. And then maybe that's a 53-year-old guy and his wife who are not going to retire for another 12 years but it's a part of our database so we want to get them on the we want to get them on our email list we want to get them on a newsletter list we want to communicate with them if if the pickleball center expands and doubles in size we want to send that to Mrs. Jones because she has interest in pickleball so we continue to build that list yes do we have any of that tracking in place at this point no. I do not know I'll buy, I'll buy, I'll buy. <laughs> but, but the point is, it's a part of marketing. It, it's, so we start out with who we are. We can't fool the market. Who are we going to target? What makes us the best and the biggest? And then the marketing program on top of that, which includes how we handle leads when they come here, how we introduce people to the process. Yes, Jeff? I was just going to ask a question about whether we have that in process, uh, or whether we do that now. I don't know if we do that now because uh, Village Homes and Lands taking that over and all the leads go to them. So that's that's how it's happening now. I can tell you how it happened before. Uh, Danette Botkin was hired by the POA uh, to, to run marketing and to service and sales for, for the POA. And so these leads that would come in would come in through a system that she set up through a sales uh, 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 management process that was on the internet. It was a very, uh, very detailed uh, internet-based uh, um, CRM program, and she would divvy those out to the realtors in the village on a, you know, on a, on a very, very fair and equitable rotation. All the information they knows had to be kept in that CRM, so your information was private, but she could see it all. Uh, she would then decide whether things were sent out to them and how cor corporately we followed up, but each individual agent decided how they would follow up. But there was a, a means to, to track whether they did follow up, whether contact was made, and ultimately whether a sale was made. And, and I think I think all the way to the end, like you said, the marketing became very clear what was working and what wasn't, because of every one of those we knew what the lead referral source was, and so we could track it. We knew where to spend our money. And David Twiggs fired her, and so that no longer exists. Now we are where we are. Perfect. And and the thing we have to understand is when we create that lead, that costs us money. We have an investment in that person that picked up the phone to call here. So just like a piece of farmland, you need to take care of that farmland. If you're going to grow something there, you need to till it. You need to kill the weeds. You need to plant the stuff in the soil. Yes? The other thing that you 
you accomplish by tracking all of that information is what other things are we missing the mark on? We're yes. getting all these people that say they want to have a central bridge playing center or something that right. you don't currently have that you not only work what you currently have, but you create new avenues too. Invaluable data. And it needs to be centralized because we need to, as a management team, as the village, as managers, we need to control what's being said and what's being done, and so we need to be able to manage that process. And we need to make sure all of these people are plugged into the marketing program. <clears throat> One of the things I used to do real quickly is in businesses, when I'd go in to analyze a business, I'd go to some guy back on a order desk somewhere and I'd say, tell me what, what your company does and what you're all about. What makes you different and unique than anybody else? In most cases, people couldn't answer that. Every employee in our organization needs to be plugged into the marketing program, right down to the you know, guys working out on the golf course and the greens and the people that run the different centers. They all need to understand who we are and what we stand for in the marketing Yes. Well, how do you reconcile the conflict between what the target market wants and you identify and what local residents do not want. Ask that again, please. And how do you reconcile between the target market wanting, uh, wanting a pool, wanting whatever it may be that we identify in that process and a local community, all of us who own this community, do not want? Okay. The Marketing, one additional thing, I really didn't want to get this deep into it, but one additional thing in this particular part of the marketing mix is our current customers, okay? In other words, all of us villagers that live here, whether you've been here a week or 25 years, we're a part of the communication strategy, okay? We need to maintain our love of the product, because ultimately that's what marketing is all about, is to deliver the product you promise. You can't deliver the product you promise only for six years and then not deliver the promise anymore. So we need everyone's input into what the village is gonna look like. However, I have a problem in general with getting the mass of villagers too involved in the business development strategic planning process. I think you get too many voices involved, too many opinions involved, and then I think you get a whole lot of people don't understand what's going on, and we get, make bad decisions because we're trying to please all of these other people. What, what, what I recommend that we do is we create the plan, we create all of the strategies that fit, fit into it, we communicate that regularly and clearly to the constituents, but we say, okay, now we've created revenue for a couple of years and we've got extra money in the capital budget, here's the kind of things that we'd like to build. All of them need to plug back into the marketing plan. So there's no point in building a gymnasium for people that are never going to use it when we could build a lodge for large groups or, or golf tournaments or those other things in there. So we can get people involved in that process. I just don't think that they should be involved in the development of the strategies themselves. It's not fair to the board or the management because they end up stretched too thin trying to do too many things and it's hard enough to do this kind of stuff without 14,000 people yelling in your ear. <laughs> Yes, sir. I think you alluded to it earlier, talked about it a little bit, but we, in my opinion, should use every resource, internal and external, as opposed to trying to create any of them. In other words, make a capital. None of this build and they will come. We need to use what we got. If we're special, then we should be able to do it and we should be able to make up for where we come up short, what we don't have. What I can tell you is the answer to that is in the marketing plan. Once you build this and this and you start layering this on top, a lot of those questions become obvious. You just go, oh yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, you're 100% right. Um, the other thing I think we need to do in the village is use the resources we've got. 
people resources that we've got. We've got a tremendous amount of people here in the village that have done this sort of stuff before. They've solved engineering problems, they've solved marketing problems, they've solved finance problems, and I think if you had a a marketing committee. I think if you had. <laughs> I think if you had people exactly that that we could use as resources. So, the board who's already stretched way too thin, they've got a whole lot more to do than we we have even to realize. You're you're going to understand this soon, young man. Um, <laughs> They don't have time to do all this, so if we had a decision-making level, let's say an engineering committee or a finance committee, the board or the CEO can come to them and go, look, I've got this problem in finance, I don't know how this is going to be paid or where we're going to get the money to do this, can you come up with something strategic and, and a plan? And then we can take four or five villagers that are off the golf course and, and, and have nothing else to do and sit down in a couple hours and talk about some ideas and then come back to the board or management with here's what we think and at least they're a leg up on the decision making process and we used consultants in the village that are free and have a tremendous amount of background and experience in this sort of thing. Like you and Jeff. Like Jeff. No, we, we would really like for you to help us. Yeah. Well, you know, I used to think when I went to a seminar, when I was working a lunch seminar or whatever, if I came away with one or two nuggets, I would feel like I benefited. One or two good ideas that I could use in my work. You've given me lots of nuggets, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And I'll give you the five dollars once we get out there. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. Yeah. I just have one comment. Yeah, five minutes. <clears throat> the professional services registry is something we started working on last year, and that's basically what we're talking about here. So we are going to be going forward with that. But my question to you is, and possibly maybe Jody might be able to comment also, where does the non-resident property owners um, do, we, do we come in in all of this? Do we want more? Do we, is it a... Well, is it just for golf? I mean, you know what I'm saying? That's a, that's a big part of yeah, balance. I, I have ideas about lots and, and non-resident lots, again, way too deep to get into here. But what I will guarantee you is if you focus on the primary things, which is getting people here, let, let's, let's do job one is let's get back up to 300 to 400 New homes so we go a year. Okay, let's get that done first, and then we'll go back and, and work on the other things. Because once you start solve that and you build the pipeline, it's kind of like take automatic pilot. We can let, take our hands off the wheel and let's go work on these other things. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much for thank, coming. Thank you.